Hey guys, it's Jim with Crawfordology, and is it time to replace the national anthem? Stay tuned. Hey guys, um, you know, in this culture of, uh, of, I guess, being so easily offended, so tender, um, are the American people now that folks are not only uh, tearing down statues and ripping down buildings and cities and anything that, uh, I guess, anything that irritates you now, you can just yank it down, break it. But the latest victim is uh, Francis Scott Key, and I think in some ways this was uh, justification for tearing down Francis Scott Key's statue. Uh, some folks wanted wanted to not look, you know, quite so foolish. So let's uh, let's find a reason that we can ensure he deserved it. So what do we do? We've decided now, uh, according to uh, Kevin, who is it, Kevin Powell, that uh, maybe the answer is to replace the uh, Star Spangled Banner. And right here, um, tells a little bit about uh, his, his background. Yeah, he was, you know, it, it was 1770s. Uh, so he did know slaves. He was born into a family that had slaves. He was very popular, uh, became close to Andrew Jackson, who, of course, was a big supporter of slavery in the South, uh, although uh, not secession, right? He fought the whole idea. Um, so, so what we're doing is we're taking some folks, we're taking any idea, and if it had any tarnish on it, anything that was unattractive, anything that somehow... Um, problematic, we we throw away the whole. So it's it's no longer the uh, being the sum of your parts. It's just the whole body of work. And if you've ever made a mistake, done something bad, you know, I wonder if there's anybody in the world who would stand up to this sort of scrutiny. Uh, certainly, including those who are who are pushing the issue. Um, so they're saying that basically because Francis Scott Key was somehow tied in with slavery, um, attacks on Native Americans. It, he, he deserves uh, to be removed from history. Um, by the way, I think they did this in ancient uh, Egypt. There is a pharaoh that uh, they struck. If you, if you ever look through one of the uh, Egyptology books or visit Egypt, uh, that all of, his, um, all of the symbols that uh, were, were built, uh, statues or otherwise, with his face on it, it's been removed, so it's the faceless pharaoh. Um, and that's what we're trying to do basically here is take anything that had any connection. And, man, you just can't go back far enough. Um, you know, are we going to do the Mayflower Compact and say because those guys knew people who had slaves, um, even though they were Puritans, you know, maybe we've got to maybe we've got to throw that document away and come up with a new one, the Magna Carta? Um Maybe that one's not good anymore. Um, so until we eradicate all vestiges of Western civilization, uh, some of these folks aren't going to be happy. And so the reason here in this article for um, removing, let's scroll scroll down a little bit, Simon, um, is that last or that third stanza, you know, the one we always sing, uh, which, uh, which you probably have have never heard or seldom heard um so i think there it's a little further down in the article that <clears throat> pull that out for me if you would um at any rate there is a a third stanza that references uh, the slave <clears throat> pardon me the slave and the um i want to say workman but it's that, that's not the right word it's uh it, the hired men or something like that it, and um wasn't safe uh, here we go he's gonna he's gonna get us down there there it is no refuge could save the hireling there we go i think workman the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave so <clears throat> so basically i think he's just encapsulating that everyone was uh you know, was dealing with the the bombs bursting in air, this this crazy uh, bombardment by the British of Fort McHenry, which was um, 
you know, Francis Scott Key was was on one of the British ships and um, and reports the story. So it becomes our Star Spangled Banner, I think, sometime around 1920 or so. It, it, w- it became our official uh, national anthem. Um, but the point being, how many things are we going to allow folks to take from us um, as a nation? How you, you can't rewrite history. You can't stamp out these ideas and simply uh, er- eradicate reason because somehow you tie it back to something offensive. I don't know, maybe I had the only mother who said this, but the world isn't fair. And sometimes you just have to deal with it. The world isn't fair because there are always going to be people who are born into better stations in life, better positions, uh, people who have more, people who have more intelligence, people who are prettier, smarter, smarter, more handsome, uh, speak better, look better, um, drive better, whatever it is. They're, they're going to have more talent, more natural talent, more guts more determination, and there is not a way to level the playing field so that everyone will feel, um, you know, perfectly even, perfectly level. That's a dream that just can't be. So, and we wouldn't want it that way. It would be a pretty vanilla world if everything, if everyone were equal and the same. Uh, Part of the richness is that we all have different gifts. We all offer the world something, something slightly different, and uh, many times something significantly different. So how can we how can we do these sorts of things and look at something as uh, as time honored and sacred as our national anthem and simply and flippantly decide that we need to replace it? You know, I think it's high time we start looking more carefully at things that can help bring us together, not drive us apart. And that would include, I think, uh, a, a little bit of um, easing from the other side on American traditions and accepting that, hey, there's some ugly parts of our history and some really great parts of our history. Um, This song, though, however, I don't think has any reference or or any significant uh, meaning towards slavery other than to mention they were there and no one could could be safe from the fear and and the trembling, right? So... um, I don't know. I, I, I guess I, I, I'm I pretty sure I know what our audience thinks about this, uh, but we want to know what you think. Is this something that uh, that you believe is, is okay or, or not okay? Um, also want to talk about Flynn today and, you know, the the bad deal that uh, that Michael Flynn has received, not just not just, by the way, from from being charged to begin with, but the whole idea that this charge was something um, really, really built up um, against Flynn. And it's, and it's clear now. Can we go to those notes? Um, and I'm sorry, the, um, having a little bit of trouble here with, with my own notes this, this afternoon. But uh, so, so basically, you know, Michael Flynn comes in working for the president and Emmett Sullivan, uh, there you go. He's he's uh, ordered the cancellation of a hearing uh, because the D.C. Uh, well, the the higher court has said, "Hey, knock it off. You've got to dismiss the charges. You're the judge. You don't have the right to uh, to charge here." So so Strzok's notes have come out, and you start to see some of the things that were in Strzok's mind when um, when he was building a case. And we're going to get that full list for you and find a way to, to have access, maybe, maybe click, put, a, put a link to it on our site. But uh, one of the things that came out really right off the bat in, in Strzok's notes is that uh, he's communicating with other FBI agents on how to handle Flynn. And they're asking questions like, should we have, or is our goal here to have him tell the truth? Is our goal here to uh, charge him? Is our goal here to trap him? Is our goal here to make him lie and then charge him? Um, you know, if you think about that, the weight of the federal government um, breathing down on you or one of your loved ones, could you really imagine what that must feel like? That you have the government working against you, knowing that you haven't done anything, but simply trying to, to build a case that will disrupt the, the presidency. And... When you see this in, in some of these notes, 
let's scroll down just a little bit. I think there is a, um, a little more. Yeah, there you go. There's there's the story. Um, so, um, but these notes actually show that this went all the way back to the president, to the vice president. Um, it, it certainly demonstrated that there was a moment where they were getting together. In fact, Powell claimed in court filing that they showed that the president, Barack Obama, called for, quote unquote, the right people to investigate Flynn, while then FBI Director James Comey, appear, Comey appeared to have said that Flynn's calls with the ambassador appear legit. So Comey says they appear legit, and the president, the outgoing president, mind you, wants there to be an investigation to get Flynn. Um, and the reason they wanted to get Flynn is they wanted to really disrupt Donald Trump's transition. And Flynn had said, had stated that his intent was to do an audit, if you will, of the intelligence community. And I think that was probably going to raise questions um, that are either hard to answer or would have embarrassed some folks on some of the work they were doing uh, before the election and, and right up to the, uh, to the inauguration against Donald Trump. So it's, uh, it, it's more than a little bit. I mean, if you recall, the Logan Act was something that uh, had, had not been used against a politician, I think, ever, <laughs> ever. So, uh, you know, many times we end up with some laws on the books that just don't get used, like uh, don't ride your elephant down Main Street on Tuesday at 730. Um, at some point, there was some reason to do that. And the Logan Act is the act that uh, tells folks, I guess, that they have to uh, register as foreign agents and then um, make, sure that, uh, make sure that they're cleared through some proper channels. Uh, sort of ridiculous to say that the, that the presidential chief of staff, incoming chief of staff, was unable to manage calls with uh, foreign, foreign governments uh, as would be expected. You know, you've won the election. We're having a little conversation. We got a victory uh, celebration. My uh, counterpart from Russia uh, has called to say congrats, and he wants to have a good working relationship. My counterpart from Great Britain has called to say congrats, and he wants to have a good working relationship. So I don't think these are extraordinary items. And as Comey uh, admitted, there was there was you know everything was legit here. But what a strange thing! What a weird world that we're living in right now to see that a government would act against an individual. And you know this is this is actually a place, a kind of a point of interest, um, where Black Lives Matter, or at least the assertions of Black Lives Matter, um, that the police are out to get them. You would think that there would be a little more understanding in some of the some of the more liberal circles here, that um, uh, the very claims they are making that that they're being targeted by police is exactly what we're able to demonstrate here with uh, with Comey and the FBI and the President of the United States potentially targeting Donald Trump and, and uh, General Flynn. So we just don't see and haven't seen things like this probably since uh, the Watergate scandal, uh, that there's been retribution and payback, but we've certainly seen it here. And uh, we're gonna get those, we're gonna get a link to those uh, notes for you so that, uh, so that you can look for yourself. And just wanted to get this out tonight. Hope you guys are doing well. We'll see you soon.